that we don't already know about the topological insulators, but uh, as it sounds counterintuitive, uh, I will talk about the dispective mechanisms that is uh, presenting in the, in the topological insulators. So um, I will start actually discussing the contact and non-contact friction. Uh, so contact friction is uh, the area, uh, it is in, in meso, it's in the mesoscale physics that we study, and uh, it actually deals with the macroscopic objects. But when we come to non-contact friction, uh, we are mostly dealing with the energy dissipation and dissipative processes, and actually how the energy is transferred from uh, one moving object to the other one, and they don't necessarily have to be in contact. And later on, I will uh, talk about the technique that I'm using to measure these kind of dissipation mechanisms at the nanoscale. And later on, I will talk about the dissipation mechanism that exists in the, in the bismuth telluride. So for the, starting with the contact friction, if we have an object sitting on another, and if you pull it to one side, we know that the uh, friction forces act on the, on the opposite side that, we, that the force we apply uh, to the moving object. And if you look at the interface, the friction all happening at the interfaces, but nothing is perfect. So uh, interfaces are also not very smooth. So we actually have this kind of interface. And at some point, we may have some, uh, some rolling frictions. And we may have some uh, places that are touching each other. And we also have places that the, uh, this nano, um, this small part is moving, but it's not actually touching to the other object, yet it can actually dissipate energy. So how this would relate to uh, today's research and technological developments, uh, today everybody is using these electronic devices, and we know that if we use them too much, they heat up. And the reason why they heat up is the joule dissipation caused by the ohmic resistance that is in, uh, in these dev devices. And then we lose the, some of the power that we give to operate these devices to the heat. So eventually, the energy is dissipated as heat. This is uh, one of the most straightforward example of non-contact dissipation um, from, the, from the devices that we use daily. And um, it's not only happening in the electronic devices, it happens everywhere. It's just a measure of scale, actually. So for example, if you take a Gal Galileo space probe signal, uh, it can measure such small dissipated power uh, on the surface of Jupiter. But it actually needs 70 meter uh, sensor to, to be able to pick up such kind of low dissipated power. So obviously, this doesn't really work for us, as we want to work in the nanoscale regime. And then we have a bunch of other techniques that are working in this small scale. And uh, there are very nice uh, studies. And um, some of them are very old, actually. Um, all of them are trying to understand what is actually happening in these in these materials, and if we can relate to those uh, to those dissipation mechanisms to any electronic structures, and how we can use this information in today's today's research to develop better quantum materials, to design quantum materials, or to even get more coherent electronic states in those materials. So, um, in my lab, actually, even before I joined, they already had uh, lots of studies with the pendulum AFM. I will explain what that is later on. But just want to take your attention to the scale special resolution um, is around nanometer. So nanometer is, OK, it's a nanoscale, but it is still not atomic. So we can still go more local. But it actually has pretty good resolution. Uh, so it's like 10 to minus 19 watt. That would uh, eventually correspond for the force, for example, maybe attonewtons if you have uh, enough soft or sensitive cantilevers. And um, then we can actually probe the maybe phase transitions, or we can probe these uh, collective uh, movements of charge density waves. And coming back to the pendulum AFM, it's nothing but a tiny pendulum oscillating over the surface, uh, which is not in contact. And from that, actually, we can get the conservative forces and dissipative forces. So if, so if you, op uh, if you oscillate this tiny pendulum over the surface, what we do is, uh, unlike a conventional AFM, we are not oscillating perpendicular to surface. So uh, in the pendulum geometry, we are averaging um, 
over Z, so very little comparing to conventional AFM. So we are actually operating in, uh, in the same force gradient over the surface. We are not uh, averaging it out over Z. And then, uh, because we can operate it in non-contact regime very well, it's not invasive, and we can use a linear response theory. And we can also tune how much we want to disturb the surface or any, any kind of um, mechanism on the surface. But then again, we, we run into this disadvantage that because it is oscillating in the, in the lateral, we are losing spatial resolution. Um, what we can do is we can replace this probe with a metallic one. It doesn't have to be actually metallic. It just has to be metal coated uh, and get a little bit stiffer one and operate it in the STM mode. Because we are using a current mode uh, as the feedback signal, we don't have to oscillate it like nanometer. And then we can take advantage of uh, STM and get very high resolution in special and uh, also get a better resolution in the, um, in the dissipation uh, scale. Comparing to tuning fork, they both have actually a similar special resolution, but still uh, this pendulum AFM has some advantages over tuning fork, and it's not only this uh, two order of magnitude dissipated power. What's the geometry? Because in a tuning fork, it's doing this, right? It's actually doing this. Oh, OK. And so you're like, OK. It is still, okay. yeah, it is still averaging over Z. It's 100 picometer. But uh, I will show later on uh, if we use this geometry and also take advantage of STM, uh, we can have a, a Z oscillation, maybe 3 picometer. And comparing to 100 picometer, it's, it's very small. And if we come to this region, then we can actually see the surface in the STM, and we, uh, we know uh, where we are looking. And then we can study the electron dynamics and phase transitions by knowing where we are actually doing the spectroscopy. Obviously, spectroscopy is a very uh, useful tool to, see what, uh, to know what we have. But we are also human, so we also like to see things. Um, having the STM is a pretty good advantage. So our cantilever is having this geometry, and uh, it's asymmetric. So we want to oscillate it over the surface. And how we get the dissipation data is as the following. So if we oscillate a beam, and if we stop it, it will stop. Um, if we stop exciting it, it will stop after some time because it will damp out because damp out because of the internal uh, damping, internal losses. Uh, so we have to excite it continuously to keep an amplitude constant here. And this uh, damping of the cantilever is depending on the decay constant. Decay constant has a direct relation to the Q factor. Uh, all all of it is a material property actually. And then, uh, if we go closer to surface, and if there is any dissipative interactions between tip and the sample, or if uh, tip is triggering certain dissipative events, then it st starts to damp out more. And if we go even closer, then it damps out much more. And then we can add additional excitation signal to keep the amplitude constant. And we can actually measure uh, how much energy we are losing just to be able to go close to surface. That would give us an idea where we are losing that energy. So uh, at the end, we can get such kind of data. We can just kick the cantilever and then excite it, and then just measure how long it takes for its uh, amplitude to damp. And we go closer, uh, measure the same thing again. We go closer, measure the same thing again. But even um, when I'm speaking now, it's it's very slow process. So we cannot do it just one by one. Uh, but what we can do is we can give the excitation depending on Z. And uh, by using a, another feedback, we can always keep this amplitude constant. So it can always go up. Uh, the excitation can always go up. And then we can measure the power dissipation uh, based on the amplitude we are using. At the same time, we can get the frequency shift data so obviously, the frequency shift is giving us an information about the forces. And uh, then the excitation giving us information about the dissipative interactions. And by using both of them, we can determine what kind of interactions we actually have and uh, which one of those are dissipative. What's the frequency? So depending on the cantilever, uh, it can change. And the one I use particularly for both STM and AFM has 250 kilohertz range. So the Q is very high. Um, at, at 5K, Q can go up to 10 to 5. 
um, like 25,000, 30,000. Um, and those are actually commercial cantilevers, so you don't have to do anything to them. That's also nice. And eventually what we would get is, uh, depending on the distance, we can measure this power dissipation. And because they already have some relationship be between the damping, damping coefficient and the power uh, dissipated power, we can uh, use either of the information. So for the rest of the slides, actually, I will use the damping coefficient because it's uh, independent from the amplitude. Uh, that's, that's more helpful uh, on such kind of surfaces. Both are corresponding to dissipation. But the idea here is to use the uh, distance dependence information to find out what kind of uh, interactions we have. So we, of course, know this out of some theory. Uh, Folokitin and Bob, um, Alexander Folokitin and Bob Parson actually developed a theory for this non-contact friction uh, for a pendulum geometry, AFM. Uh, the first thing that we run into is the dual dissipation mechanism. It's the most known because it is due to the long range interactions. It's due to the electrostatic interactions. It can go up to 100, uh, it can go up to 100 nanometers, even maybe microns. So it's easy to detect it. But at some point, it can be actually a little bit problematic because it's too high. It's dominating the whole process. So what ha happens here is uh, it's like the ohmic resistance, uh, but we have a charge, finite charge at the end of the tip, and then we are moving it back and forth. Uh, the mirror charge, it created also moving back and forth, but in the crystal. So although my actual charge is not facing any dissipation or friction, the charge that is created in the crystal is uh, facing that friction because there's a finite resistance in the crystal, and this mirror charge is actually face, um, feeling that. So that's how we actually uh, probe that kind of dual dissipation mechanism. And then if you go um, to the damping coefficient, we see that uh, because it's an electrostatic interaction, it definitely has a voltage square dependence. And uh, distance dependence can be uh, different depending on if you have only insulator, if you have a metal or metal on insulator. Uh, so we have to know a little bit about our sample, but we can actually uh, pick up find out this, this um, distance dependence as well. If we go to closer region, let's say we don't have any dual dissipation and we go tens of nanometer closer to surface, then we mostly deal with the stochastic friction force. This is due to the Van der Waals interaction between tip and the sample. And uh, here, the example is just a Brownian motion. And uh, we know that, for example, this yellow particle would move from here to here. Maybe it can go here, it can come back again. But we don't actually have any control over it, so we cannot use the energy that we spend on this uh, particle. Uh, it just go any point randomly. So that's how, how the energy is lost here. Uh, an example to this would be, for example, fluctuating charges. We cannot make work out of fluctuating charges in the crystal. When you say fluctuating, you mean uh, charges, what are the Um, I'm not sure if you can maybe uh, put them into resonances willingly, uh, but for example, if we have a metal and uh, there are charges everywhere, like free-like charges, and depending on temperature, they can actually fluctuate more and interact more. We cannot really use that. That's that's more what I mean. Or I, I will show later on if you uh, if you tunnel to a state, then the charge is fluctuating there as well, uh, but. At some point, because of these interactions, it, it dissipates again. So you need to end the temperature? Uh, I mean, we are at finite temperature, yes. It will depend on temperature. So this one also has a V-square dependence. And again, the distance dependence is changing depending on what we have on the, um, on the surface. The third mechanism is happening at the very close distances. Uh, it maybe needs a bit more energy. But still, it's possible to excite the phonons inside the crystal. And when we excite those, we also lose energy to those. Um, uh, we are not going to deal with this too much. We are mostly uh, going to deal with the joule dissipation and the, and the van der Waals friction in this uh, work. Uh, so phononic friction is relatively easy to determine because it's already happening at the very close distances. If we can overcome these two big um, dissipation mechanisms, we can go to very close and find out if it's phononic or not. 
And it also has a v to the power 4 dependence to the applied bias. Uh, it's relatively easier to distinguish comparing to uh, Julian's Van der Waals friction. So coming back to my technique, uh, just to sum it up before I show any data. Um, so in the AFM, I'm operating in the pendulum geometry and I have an amplitude. It operates like around 3 nanometer or further away in general if I want to use an AFM feedback. Uh, but then I get a force information. I get a, a topography with a poor special resolution, and I get an information about the dissipated energy. And then I can go back to STM because I have a metallic tip now. I can use the current as a feedback. I can get a topography with good special resolution, and I can learn about the local dense stove states. But again, it's a little bit hard to uh, combine these both together. I can use a current feedback because I cannot go very close if I'm using AFM. I can use current feedback and go closer and oscillate it just a little bit uh, enough to get a dissipation signal. So that would then allow me to combine both the electronic information from uh, current and the, the dissipation information from the mechanism. So when we come to the bismuth telluride, um, so we are happy that there is no electron backscattering because we have a topologically protected surface state. So we shouldn't be having so much uh, dual dissipation as well. So what we did was to scan the surface with the STM, find a clean area, and uh, get the DIDV, and get this uh, Dirac-like cone that's supposed to hint that we actually have the topologically protected surface state, and then do a dissipation measurement on it. So this is the distance dependence, and here is the damping coefficient. And we did all the measurements at these uh, different voltages. When I uh, have the power of it, they are actually showing d to the power minus 1.5 dependence. And uh, if you go back to the, um, to the theory, there is actually no uh, theory. As, to, as far as I know, there is no theory developed yet for such surfaces for the non-contact dissipation. Uh, but if we take, a, uh, for example, an insulator, bulk insulator, and a metal surface, like as an analogy to topological insulators, because the bulk is supposed to be insulator and the, sub the surface is supposed to be conducting. So we can take analogy of um, insulating and on top of it a metal um, film, then we can maybe use, use that. And if we take that, it also shows a, a distance to the um, 1 over distance to the power 3 over 2. So it's actually fitting pretty well even at different voltages. I guess the, the image chart just, just comes out of actual image. And so yeah. it just says it's stuff underneath is conducting, but you don't, there's no more information than that. Yes. So how does it know the difference between a metallic surface state and something that's conducting? So but it's the electric field lines coming in or coming in perpendicularly to the same space that it's using. Yes. So um, when we go, for example, to tantalum disulfide, yeah. so you see the, the damping coefficient orders are quite, I mean, it's not high comparing to uh, some high resistive That's things. When you move it. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but when I come to this one, actually, uh, except this 5 volt, I will show after 5 volt actually something's happening. And before that, uh, I have around 2 order of magnitude difference. So comparing to the generic materials, this is uh, pretty low so for a dual dissipation. Not this, hmm? not this existence of the surface charge, but when you move it back. Yeah. And if you have a metal, it's supposed to be also screened. Uh, but then you would get, for example, information about the scattering centers and so on. So in, in principle, with a perfect insulator, we shouldn't be able to create any charge. And uh, right? Yeah. Uh, well, but I mean, when I bring this, this charge close to the insulator, only insulator, yeah. it shouldn't really create a, create a charge inside. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's exactly, yes. It's, it, nothing is perfect, but in a perfect world, with the insulator, it shouldn't happen. Should it? I think so. OK, maybe we should discuss that. Um, but let's, let's assume that we don't actually have uh, this image charge created in the bulk, but uh, mostly affected by the, by the thin film over yeah. the surface. And when we go to 9 volt, actually, what happens is 
uh, it's coming and then it's rising. There's nothing wrong about it, but it's rising around 10 nanometer and then it decreases a little bit. It's not going to the background. So, I mean, I would say that there is actually a, some dissipation channel is opening and it's not actually fully closed. And then it's rising again, it's not going back. And, but it's not continuously rising. There's something happening at, at certain distances at this voltage. So we cannot actually explain this by the topological insulator uh, or surface state behavior. And coming to the STM, uh, these energies are too low comparing to the nine volt. And um, it's also hard to explain it with this one. But uh, there's one more measurement we can do with the STM is uh, that is ZV spectroscopy. And with that, actually, we can go uh, higher voltages. Uh, when we do, it, do this on, on such surfaces, actually, we get these step-like features. And those step-like features are studied a lot on metal surfaces and are known as image potential states. So those are the states. If, we, if there's a band gap on the surface projected band structure of a metal, and if there are excess electrons on the surface, then uh, this Coulomb-like potential is creating some unoccupied but uh, bond in Z kind of states. And those states are um, described like Rydberg-like series. They are following that kind of energy dependence. Uh, and they are unoccupied. So those states are actually studied a lot by the two-photon photo emission inverse photo uh, emission studies. And on metals, they are pretty well known. Uh, and um, when we actually derive uh, this the signal, then we also see how uh, the energy spacing of those states are coming, coming closer, just like in the Rydberg-like series. So uh, there is a couple of studies uh, with the, let's say, optical studies on the, on the topological insulators and image potential states. So they are trying to uh, understand the dynamics of electrons using these image potential states. And uh, in this work, we also studied it uh, with a little bit with the STM and then also their dissipative process with the AFM. And recently, actually, uh, from Jenny's group, there's another paper came out. Uh, they also studied on the antimony. And uh, it's how they behave uh, over a step edge on antimony surfaces. So uh, these are known quite a lot on the, on the metals, but not as much on topological insulators or topological systems or these kind of quantum materials yet. So I will continue by showing how they are actually acting when we, uh, when we look at them with the AFM. So uh, in this curve, this purple one is the derivation uh, from the scanning tunneling microscopy measurement. And at the same time, uh, we oscillate the tip a little bit. So just like, uh, I think it's like 30, 30 picometer. Yeah, it's 30 picometer. And also uh, collected the damping coefficient data. So when we go over the voltage, I told you that actually with the voltage, it's supposed to increase all the time, which is not happening here. So it's increasing. And something is happening when I start to populate this state. And it's decreasing again. And the same thing happening over and over when I go to higher orders of those states. So um, we are speculating that the fluctuation dissipation is actually rising when we populate those states. And in the meantime, because of the screening, dual dissipation is suppressed. And when we come to the, um, if you compare the oscillating to a non-oscillating tip, we see that the full width half max of some of the states are changing with an oscillating tip, but the first one is not changing at all. So uh, here, the, this is the first one. It's not changing much. This is the ratio of the uh, full width half max of, of those states uh, with an oscillating and non-oscillating tip. And if we oscillate the, oscillate the tip, then we see the, uh, the full width half max is getting wider. Uh, in the higher orders, that's supposed to be corresponding the decrease in their lifetimes. Because in the STM measurements, if we measure such kind of states, the full width half max is supposed to be related to the uh, lifetime. And it's changing. It means that the lifetime is changing. So already we know that if we uh, approach the surface with our, our tip and oscillate while we are populating those states, we can manipulate them. At least their lifetime, we can, uh, we can interact with them. So we propose this model. Uh, to explain what we actually measure with the, with the AFM and what's actually happening when there are these image potential states. Here is the tunneling gap for the STM. And uh, 
we have our tip biased and the sample and the image potential states uh, of the sample on this side. So normally, uh, with the STM, we take into account one capacitance between tip and the sample. And AFM is a bit more sensitive to the capacitances. And uh, it actually senses this difference in the second capacitance caused by the image potential states. Because between the image potential states and the surface, there's, uh, there's also a time lag. So the electron is actually tunneling to the state, leaves there for some time, and then um, it either goes to lower, lower energy levels or going, going back to the crystal. So while it's doing that, uh, here, actually, this is a very nice uh, graph from, from the News and Views um, article for our paper. So I have my charge in the tip and image potential states here, the purple line, and uh, I have my sample. So we are tunneling to the states it lives there and it goes back to the sample. But in the meantime, it's it continuously uh, interacting with our tip and it's also interacting with the sample as well. So the tip is also interacting with the sample as well because the Van der Waals interactions are not going anywhere. And apparently AFM is actually uh, sensitive to that. Um, so if we look at the both voltage dependence and the distance dependence, we get such a map. So we can actually see how they are evolving. Um, at, in the same map. So these high um, dissipation lines are belonging to the image potential states. And we see that they are actually going further away. They are going to higher voltages if the tip sample distance is increasing. So this is simply because uh, actually, here it's, it seems actually better. It's because the AFM is sensing the capacitive uh, interaction and the capacitance is linearly dependent on uh, tip sample distance as long as the distance is bigger than the uh, tip, tip radius. So that's why actually at these higher distances we have this linear dependence and we come closer uh, less than 4 nanometer then it starts to be nonlinear. That's also suggesting actually our uh, effective tip radius is around below 4 nanometer. Sorry. That's exactly what Sorry. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's how we estimated our tip radius because that's, that's known that the, it's supposed to be, the capacitance is supposed to be linearly depending if the tip radius is uh, smaller than the tip sample distance. Sorry? Uh, tip is actually uh, gold coated uh, silicon, highly doped silicon. Yeah, it's in double It's, yeah. Uh, so we uh, actually those cantilevers are only available with either platinum coated or gold coated, uh, but I can show a effect of the work function because sometimes we pick up things from the surface and to coat gold uh, to any surface usually chromium used as a wetting layer and that chromium can diffuse on top. So and we actually have effectively three terminated tips at some point and uh, I can show you the effects of it. I mean, we don't have lower work function, but yeah, we, we just have different materials, yeah. So if we take a cross section uh, around like five nanometers, we get this kind of uh, voltage curve. Uh, and here is the, the force showing a nice parabola. Okay, nice, we have some electrostatic interaction, but we don't have a parabola here. And those maximas are also uh, corresponding, corresponding to the image potential states. So the these damping coefficient actually, if we calculate, uh, corresponds to tens of milli EV per cycle. Uh, cycle is the cycle of our cantilever, which is at 250 kilohertz. And uh, it's from the previous studies, it's known that this is corresponding to single or few electron tunneling to, with the quantum dot studies, it, it can be measured. And uh, it's corresponding to single or few electron tunneling. And uh, that's exactly actually what we are suggesting here as well. Uh, so I promised you that has something to do with the topological insulators and um, so far we only measured that there may be some image potential states and they may be dissipative. But what happens to the topologically protected surface states or if we, if we remove it or do we actually have it? So we did a magnetic field dependence measurement and here is the damping coefficient at different magnetic uh, fields perpendicular to sample. Um, this is the curve just I, I showed you just one slide ago. But uh, they are shifted just for the clarity. 
So those peaks are my image potential states. And when we go to higher magnetic field, they are going to lower voltages. Actually, we don't have full understanding of this, why this is happening. But another thing we realize here is that they are becoming less pronounced, actually, when we go to high, uh, high magnetic field. It's not that they are going away, but the, the parabola is actually approaching to being a real parabola here, and they are, becoming, they are staying in the background. So higher magnetic field moves the peaks to lower voltages and uh, makes the peaks more suppressed. And the, the curve itself is approaching to parabola. And what I told you was that the parabola is suggesting a strong joule dissipation. So let's look at the, so the, the magnetic field perpendicular. sample. Yeah. I mean, also to tip, yeah. So at the, at the zero volt, without having additional electric field, uh, we look at how the how the damping coefficient is actually changing. And when we uh, plot singular data here, we see that up to 0.2 millitesla, uh, 0.2 tesla, it's not rising at all. And after that, actually, it's after around 0.3, it's starting to rise. And actually, this, um, this is following a Kohler rule because, uh, if you apply, because of the magnetic resistance. And if you uh, increase the resistance in the crystal, then it's also starting to rise. So here, what we are suggesting is that the, uh, we break the topological, protected, topological protection by applying a magnetic field. And when it is lifted, uh, then the um, electron backscattering is coming back in action. And when we have the electron backscattering, this is contributing to dual dissipation. That's why uh, this, is, this is rising. And this is only happening after 0.33 Tesla. So to sum it up, actually, um, we measured the image potential states on, on bismuth telluride uh, and with both scanning tunneling spectroscopy and dissipation spectroscopy. And that they found out that the dissipation due to fluctuation is enhanced by the presence of image potential states. And actually, I, I would like to note that the reason why we could actually measure such kind of um, dynamics is because its dual dissipation was already low. So uh, with a sample, that has high dual dissipation, that would be very hard. And this suppression is happening because uh, there is no electron backscattering thanks to this topologically protected surface state. And then uh, by lifting the topological protection using a magnetic field, we measured that the, um, the dual dissipation is also rising because uh, as a result of electron backscattering. Uh, so this work was done in univers at the University of Basel. And um, I was in the group of Ernst Mayer while I was doing this work. And uh, I'd like to thank Martin Kissel uh, personally, because uh, that's how we made this, this, this thing work. And also, this is a collaboration with Professor Osan Gürdü, uh, who is in Istanbul Technical University. Thank you for your attention.